Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Last week, a federal judge in Texas issued a ruling to revoke the Food and Drug Administration's 23-year-old approval of a medication. This poses threats to the U.S. government's regulatory that could go far beyond any one drug. And this appears to be the first time a court has moved toward the ordering of removal of an approved drug from the market over the objection of the FDA. The ruling could open the door to lawsuits to contest approvals or regulatory decisions related to other medications. And if upheld, the Texas decision would shake the very framework of our reliance on the FDA's pathways for developing new drugs. Welcome to The Health Advocates, a podcast that breaks down major health news of the week to help you make sense of it all. I'm Stephen Newmark, Director of Policy at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. And I'm Zoe Rothblatt, Associate Director of Community Outreach at GHLF. Our goal is to help you understand what's happening in the healthcare world to help you make informed decisions to live your best life. And today we're going to talk about a recent ruling by a federal judge around some medication that's been approved decades ago and, you know, how this impacts our community living with chronic disease. But before we get into that, we do have a few news updates. Yeah, so let's get into it. The FDA is set to authorize a second booster. Very cool. So yeah, they're expected to announce this, and this would be a second Omicron-specific booster for those who are 65 and older and those with a weakened immune system. So very pertinent to our community. Yeah, absolutely. Once authorized, eligible individuals can get it if it has been four months since the first shot of the bivalent booster. Yeah, and we'll definitely keep our community updated on this. For our second news item, I know you love these. We have quick poll results. This time we asked about exercise habits, especially because COVID's just changed the way a lot of us exercise. Like, for instance, we don't have a commute anymore, so we lost that daily walking that we once had and have to find different ways. And we're just curious what our community does especially living with chronic disease where it's unpredictable. So this is what the results showed. Most people, in fact, exercise daily or weekly. About half said, you know, multiple times a week to every day. And then about 20% said often weekly. So that means that around 70% are exercising daily or weekly, which was pretty surprising. Pretty high, for sure. What does that mean, exercise? I'm just curious. How do you define exercise? Like walking to the garage to get the car? Does that count? (laughs) Where do you cross the threshold? I think it's like about intentional movement. We didn't ask specifically about what kinds of exercise. It was more looking at how often and what barriers. So two of the biggest barriers were chronic pain and chronic fatigue that stop people from exercising. But I would say it's more just like with the intention to get movement into your day would count as exercise. Interesting. I mean, when it comes to intentionally exercising, as you put it, or intentionally moving, intentional movement, personally, I find the biggest barrier to be time, to set aside time. Like you said, if you're commuting, you don't have to set aside time. If you're walking, you know, that's sort of built into your day. But if you need to set aside time to go to a gym or to set aside time to say, hey, I'm going to walk for the next 30 minutes around the neighborhood. That's my number one barrier. 19% agree with you. They said not enough time. There you go. It's like the family feud, number three on the board. But I will say this, talking about like changing habits because of the pandemic. So I used to, I like working out middle of the day. I've never been someone who's able to wake up early and work and exercise. I've never been somebody who's able to exercise at the end of a work day. I'm just too exhausted. And I find, frankly, to my dismay, that the the gyms are much more crowded during the day because people have much more flexibility in their work day. So I don't get that. I used to like going to the gym, particularly when it was less crowded. So now I don't have that advantage. So now I'm, I find myself going earlier and earlier into like the uh, seven o'clock hour, which I don't like to do. But anyway, you know, just one digression on, on how exercise habits have changed in that sense. Exactly. It's different for everyone. And like you said, you have to find what works for you in order to make it a regular practice. Definitely. Definitely. So let's jump into our topic. Stephen, I'm hoping you could walk us through the timeline, some of the big, you know, rulings here as a lawyer. I'd love to hear your perspective on what's going on. So what we're talking about is that last week, a federal judge in Texas issued a ruling to revoke the Food and Drug Administration's 23-year-old approval of a medication known as Mufapristone. Uh, Now, this medication is used primarily for terminating pregnancy and also has other medical uses as well. It was approved in the year 2000, so it's been on the market for 23 years, but the judge 
is essentially overruling the FDA's rule, approval and saying that it's not safe and effective. And I'm really oversimplifying things in a real in the real world scenario as we're recording. The judge put a seven day stay on. The Department of Justice is asking to have that stay extended, is looking to get to the appellate court. That's the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to have that listened to. But in blunt terms, as best as any as legal commentators can tell, this is the first time a judge has essentially overruled the FDA. Um, and it, this ruling could open the door to lawsuits to contest approvals or regulatory decisions related to other medications or vaccines. We live in this crazy anti-vax world. And if this decision is upheld, it could really shake the very framework of patients' reliance and um, doctors' reliance and the pharmaceuticals industry reliance on the FDA's pathways for developing new drugs. There's so many layers to this. I think the first is that, um, like you said, this is undermining the FDA's authority. We talk about this all the time. As our listeners may know, I have another podcast called Breaking Down Biosimilars. And like especially we talk about this in the context of biosimilars, about the FDA's rigorous studying of medications and how they look at safety and efficacy and how they have to run animal studies, human clinical trials, post-market surveillance, all this stuff to say that a medication is safe. This one in particular has been around 23 years. You know, we look at that and say, okay, this is like a tried and true medication that's been around for a long time. We see the effects of it and we know that it's safe in post-market surveillance. So it's really shocking to see that for the first time, a court has moved to order the removal of a drug like this. Yeah. To remove it from the market is um, quite, unpre you know, I don't want to hate to overuse the word, but it's unbelievable to say the least. You know, let's just take a step back and give a little bit of background on who the FDA is, where this, where their authority comes from. In 1939, Congress gave the FDA overarching authority to, to determine whether drugs are safe and effective in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. Drug companies must conduct a series of animal studies and human clinical trials that can take years and millions of dollars, frankly, to provide enough evidence to the FDA that a drug is safe and effective in treating a disease or a medical condition. And now this ruling is coming in and contradicting all that work that the FDA does. It's put the FDA authority into a spotlight like never before. Absolutely. It, the case is probably going to go to the Supreme Court. And just as someone living with chronic illness, and, you know, we represent people with chronic illness. It genuinely scares me that judges, people in this country are able to fight and undermine the FDA like this, especially as someone who relies on medications to keep me functioning in everyday life. I'm just wondering to what end, where does this go? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Like, you know, we were saying earlier, it's scary because if a judge, a single judge anywhere in the country is able to essentially pull product from the market, you can envision scenarios where anti-vax folks are able to find an anti-vax judge with sympathetic views and pull a vaccine from the market based upon similar ruling, if you will. And, you know, not to mention basically any medication folks don't like and they can get to a judge and the judge could issue the ruling. So it's scary to say the least. I mean, since the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act passed in 1938, courts have usually deferred to the federal agency's scientific expertise and oversight. And, you know, we saw this this past summer with mesotrexate acts and while that seemed to have died down and of course people were restricted access it seems to have the situation improved a bit but we know that when situations like this are happening it also does cause you know pharmacists to take pause doctors to take pause and even though we don't know the final ruling yet people could have restricted access already even though it's still available and all this news gets people to be overly cautious and people are not able to access their medications like how we saw with methotrexate i've seen some states are already stockpiling this medication specifically so people can have access. But it's also just the implication of the news going around has such an impact on, you know, direct patient access already. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like you said, it essentially throws chaos into the world of the pharmaceutical industry, the medical community, and the patient community. It's a head scratcher and people don't know what to do. And oftentimes people can be cautious and say, well, I'd rather just not get involved. And the easiest way to do that is if I'm a doctor, not to prescribe a medication. If I'm a pharmacist, it's not to fulfill certain prescriptions. And it's scary if you're a patient because throughout all of this, the patient voice tends to get lost. The individuals who are out there being most affected by such a, I call it a perverse authority scene in our judiciary. So let's walk through some of the timeline of this. What happened exactly after the judge, you know, declared that this approval should be invalid? 
Sure. As I mentioned, he did put a seven day stay on that on the exact same day, I guess, coincidentally, or perhaps not coincidentally. I don't really know. A case in Washington state that was brought by Democratic attorney generals from 17 states and the District of Columbia was live and it was challenging extra restrictions that the FDA imposes on mufepristone. And in a preliminary injunction, the judge there in Washington state ordered the FDA specifically not to limit the drug's availability in those jurisdictions. So you're talking about 17 states plus the District of Columbia have been ordered not to limit the availability. So now you have essentially two competing rulings and those are in two different circuits, not to get too bogged down, but the appellate courts in the United States are broken down to nine circuits. So you're dealing with two separate circuits, one out of Texas and one out of Washington state. And if there's a conflict at the circuit level as well, eventually it's likely to make its way up to the Supreme Court. And in the immediate aftermath in the Texas case, the Justice Department, which is representing the FDA, of course, immediately said it would appeal the Texas injunction to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. So what happens next? This is like a lot of legal jargon. Yeah, there's a lot of legal jargon. That's true. So some folks have called upon the Biden administration and Health and Human Services to ignore the judge's ruling. They have actually come out and said that they will not ignore a judge's ruling. That's probably not the smartest move. It's also not a way to endear yourself to the Supreme Court where you ultimately want to get a ruling in your favor. So the likely scenario is that this makes its way to the Supreme Court. Now, does the ruling get stayed until it gets to the Supreme Court? That remains to be seen. And what happens in those 17 states versus the rest of the country? Again, it's very chaotic to say the least. We're dealing with one specific drug. I will add there's starting to become political pressure to bear. There was a medical community in the pharmaceutical industry have put out missives decrying this ruling. So we'll see where it goes is my tepid answer. I know it's not fun to say that. Let me get back into more comfortable waters for myself. I will just say the ruling could violate the Constitution's Commerce Clause, which prohibits states from impairing interstate commerce. And also the Supremacy Clause, which says that federal laws, in this case, Congress's decision to authorize the FDA to regulate drugs, have priority over conflicting state laws. This theory has rarely been tested in court. However, there was a case that involved Massachusetts about a decade ago, uh, where their Massachusetts tried to ban a new opioid because state officials worried that the drug itself could be abused, leading to addiction or overdose. A federal judge in that case ruled that states do not have authority on their own to ban such a drug. So not exactly on point because that was done by the state of Massachusetts and not by a federal judge, but it gives you an idea of how the federal judiciary has deferred generally to the FDA. Right. So could this case be used then in support precedent to uphold the availability of the drug? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. General precedent is uh, under the Commerce Clause and under the Supremacy Clause. It's you, you defer to Congress's decision to authorize the FDA to regulate drugs such as the one at issue here. Well, you know, that kind of just begs me to ask how then a judge is even capable of making this ruling in the first place if these clauses are in place at federal power. Well, you know, rulings are made by judges. Judges are humans. Humans, they're not always, they don't always get things right and they do get overturned. That's why there are appellate courts to sometimes overrule lower courts and so forth. And even then, even at the highest level, judges, shall we say, sometimes get things wrong. We've had some horrific decisions uh, over the years that are uh, even at the Supreme Court level. We've had the Dred Scott case, Plessy versus Ferguson, which uh, said that separate but equal did not violate the equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment that was overturned decades later by Brown versus Board of Education. So there are bad rulings that occur or what a lot of legal scholars would consider to be bad rulings. It happens. And, you know, that's just how it, I guess that's the best answer I can possibly give is how it can be done. But I will add judges are human, so they are receptive to the real world. And in this situation, upending the FDA's authority could be disruptive to an entire industry, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, to patients, to the medical community. You know, the industry itself spends many years and millions of dollars looking for drug approval. If FDA approval can be withheld by a judge, by one federal judge somewhere in the United States, this could really stifle drug manufacturers from seeking out new therapies. So Again, these folks live in the real world, these judges, so hopefully they'll be receptive to um, the real world consequences of their ruling. Well, that's right. That's what's scary, too, right? It's not just attacking a current drug. It also has implications for innovation and just uncertainty for the entire biopharma industry for years to come if this is actually capable of going through. 
Right. Yeah, it's scary. Knock on wood, you know, we'll certainly keep our eyes on this and we'll see where it goes. As I said, it's likely to end up all the way at the Supreme Court. In a scenario like this, is there anything that we can do just as a patient, as a person? Like, who could we call when something goes to the Supreme Court like this? Sure. Well, there, there is nothing at the Supreme Court, so there's no one to call right now. I think we're at the phase where it's just getting educated on what this does. Inserting your voice to elected officials is always a welcome thing. The idea that you don't want to live in a world where you're worried that you take a certain cocktail of drugs and you don't want to find, you know, you don't want to live in a world where a non-experted medical expert judge can revoke the use of those drugs is something that is scary for you. And that's something that can be expressed, certainly to elected officials. And, you know, there may come a moment where there's an opportunity to insert yourself in the litigation itself as a as an amicus curiae, which means friend of the court. Those are individuals who may not uh, be litigants in the case, plaintiff or defendant, but have you know some particular special concern about the outcome of how that case could affect them going forward. So that's that could be an area where groups like the Global Healthy Living Foundation might insert themselves and might be seeking patients to help with that. So bottom line, get educated and stay tuned. We will certainly keep our community updated and raise your voice wherever you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Stephen, that brings us to the close of our show. What did you learn today? I learned that our folks, our GHLF folks, like to exercise. So good for everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. I almost forgot about that with all of this chaos. And, you know, for me, I just learned a lot about the judicial process and all of this from you. So thank you for that debrief. Well, we hope that you learned something, too. And before you go, we definitely want you to check out all of our podcasts at ghlf.org backslash listen. Thanks, everyone, for listening to The Health Advocates, a podcast that breaks down major health news of the week to help you make sense of it all. If you like this episode, please give us a rating and check us out on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. I'm Zoe Rothblatt. I'm Stephen Newmark. We'll see you next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Thank you.